Welcome back, everyone, to the Open Web Forum at COGX, curated by Fabric Ventures. It's the final panel for day two and an hour-long special at that. So who better to round us off than our very own managing partner, Richard Muirhead, moderating music, broken, and being investigated. Richard, I think you need no introduction. So straight over to you. Ian, thank you so much. And hi to everybody from um, our kind of greenhouse on the top of the uh, Aga Khan building here in King's Cross. Um, yeah, very excited about this panel. I've been hearing that a lot of other people are excited about this panel, um, uh, perhaps appropriately for one that uh, has in, uh, included uh, different artists. We've had people who have been on the panel and then off the panel and back on the panel and then off the panel again. Who knows, maybe some people will join us uh, during this next hour. Um, but suffice it to say, I'm, I'm going to just summarize a little bit about um, the, the topic um, and then introduce um, our, our panelists. Um, I think if, if you take the long view of a few decades, it's definitely um, uh, indubitably the case that technology has transformed the way in which music has been created, it's been delivered, it's been consumed. Um, but it also probably would be beyond the debate that has not necessarily always been in the interests of the creators, of the artists themselves, um, and that we're not really tapping into that, that you know, global, inestimable pool of talent that exists out there um, and not rewarding uh, the creators uh, in the way that is, uh, is appropriate. Uh, within that, there's uh, contentious debates around the way in which uh, uh, those creators should get uh, paid within the current structure of the royalty laws. And then there's very exciting new developments in terms of technology around what are known as uh, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, and how they, those might deliver a more direct relationship between fan and creator. Uh, one that can unlock a conversation um, over the lifetime of that relationship, but also uh, unlock a different approach, a more ownership-driven approach to the connection between you know, all, all those many enthusiasts. Um, and it's, it's starting to really bite with exciting platforms like uh, Audius um, uh, and uh, I think uh, many other places you can mint uh, NFTs, and we're going to hear more about that from the assembled uh, panelists. Um, and so, you know, one might say that, um, you know, we're here to talk about saving the music industry. Um, it is it is true that um, back in 2003, Steve Jobs quoted Hunter S. Thompson in saying that the music business is, in fact, a cruel and shallow money trench a long plastic hallway where thieves and pimps run free and good men die like dogs. And there's also actually a negative side. So maybe we don't need to save it. Maybe we need to transform it. And maybe we can talk about some of the ways in which we uh, can do that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce, uh, hopefully first, Annabella Coldrick. Hello, lovely to be here. Annabella is the CEO of the Music Managers Forum, which represents artist management in the UK, but obviously also operates on a kind of uh, a wider global network. Um, she previously spent some time at the Design C Council, has worked heavily on policy for the creative industry, an essential voice for all those artists, uh, even being brave enough to take up a position of advocacy in Brussels. Um, and we're extremely happy uh, to have her with us today. Um, Second, uh, we'd like to introduce uh, Ed Young, the founder of NFT.HipHop. Hi, Ed. Hello. Um, hello. Um, so a storied uh, background, um, including a publisher of the, the Source magazine as a Harvard undergrad um, and a CEO of a, a couple of different companies in healthcare. Um, and and I think uh, just judging from the brief interactions we've had in the green room, uh, a, a great talent for uh, connecting with with people across all sorts of different um, arenas, uh, and maybe getting them to to work together. And then excitingly working on the very cutting edge of the music industry now in the in the shape of on the guise of NFT hip hop. So I'm excited to hear what Ed's got to say. Welcome, Ed. Thank you. Happy to be here. And Peter De Paolo. Last, absolutely not least, or maybe not last, because we still may, we may get Blau, we may get, who knows, going to pop up at any point into this panel, and we've got an hour to see if they do. But we're very happy to have Peter DePaolo here, who's head of developer relations uh, with Near Protocol, which um, 
you know, from a disclosure perspective, Fabric is an investor in, and I'm actually on the, the foundation council there. Um, so we're very focused in a very broad sense of building a, a healthy community um, for not just developers, but also creators. Um, and uh, Peter has a successful career over the best part of a decade now doing what I always thought is the hardest thing within um, the kind of tech business, which is is product and actually getting stuff shipped. Um, uh, but Peter, welcome um, and thank you for joining us. So um, who would like to kick off with defining, you know, perhaps what the music industry is today, how where the, the power resides, and, and in what sense it is broken and needs fixing, or whether we just you know tear it up and start again? Um, I'd like to give a, a bit more of an optimistic take possibly on the music industry. I think it has transformed, possibly slowly, and possibly uh, it's been resistant to some of that transformation. But there are more artists earning money from music than ever before. The barriers to entry where you think back 20, 30 years ago were the only way to get your physical product into physical stores to be able to get to fans was that you had to go through signing to a record company, major or independent. Those days have gone and you can release your music for free. However, that 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 widespread uh, ability to access the market comes with at a cost in that there's more noise than ever before and it's harder than ever to reach fans. I think that's one of the biggest challenges is for all these new artists making great music is to be able to cut through that noise and build an audience, which is where we'll go on to talk about how technology can help to do that. But there are problems with the industry. That's not to say everything is fine. And in particular, some of the structures that have evolved from the days of uh, sheet music publishing through to the, the physical formats of the 20th century and into the digital have led us to a legacy of possibly very outdated, or indeed in many cases, very outdated structures of rights management built in a physical era, an analog era that really don't translate to the digital. And that can often be a barrier to technological process. We see people all the time who come in and say, I've got a great idea. All I need is artists to come along and bring their fans to it. And it's going to be equitable. And it's going to pay the artist directly. And you say, hang on a minute. You do realize that most artists who've got a, a large degree of fans no longer own their rights particularly the more legacy ones. So there are barriers in place within the way the industries evolve that unfortunately, in many cases, make it very hard for these incredible buzzy ideas to take root and they have to work within some of the structures of the industry or help us come campaign to uh, uh, to update and modernize them. So, so what I'm hearing, Annabella, is that we are we are trapped, or the artists are trapped, by the way it's currently uh, structured, uh, both in terms of the processes and the, and the, and the contracts. Um, and I do want to return to this question of maybe some of the not so re so revolutionary technologies that fans are also of other creators are using to access their fan base, and we should come back to that yeah. certainly. And and maybe you can react to my uh, pr provocative. Um, um, statement um but want to kind of scoot around a little bit and we'll come back to it yep. for certain um ed do you want to do you want to go next with your yeah, perspective I, on you know, you know, where's the I, power lies is it broken is it not do we you know should we so start again it, it's so interesting as annabella everything you've said is true for a certain segment of the music industry and one of the things that you know that drew me to cryptocurrency, the blockchain, the promise of it was that it so mirrored what we had been through in the hip hop community. Hip hop started in a very different manner from any of the other genres in that, you know, artists were making their own music. They were now it was an amalgamation of other sounds. So, you know, you had artists in Harlem and the Bronx where it started pulling music from Germany, getting craft work and different sounds and pulling them together. And so there were rights issues, but you know, hip hop, they just, we ignored it. And <laughs> you're selling stuff out of the trunk of your car. You're selling stuff directly to your fans. So, so all of these impediments that the industry sees right now are just totally unreal to me. I, when I started our magazine, we, you know, we had literally 250 US dollars. And everybody told us you needed $5 million to start a real magazine. And we were hip hop and we said, okay, so we did it anyway. And that's the thing. This is not a binary relationship. You have to cobble these things together 
and make it happen. And that's the nature, the fundamental nature of blockchain. People hear NFTs solve everything. No, they don't solve everything, but they give you a tool that you can use to start solving and transforming to a way that's going to be beneficial to the artists themselves. And yes, so many are tied up in their old contracts or make new music. They're creatives, that's what they do. You make the new music that's not under contract. And there, there are solutions. It's just like we come from a space where we've been denied access for so long, we don't see those as barriers. They're just things that are. It's a, I think it's a really crazy, interesting uh, point or series of points you may, make there. Um, in the kind of technology industry, often people speak of, you know, looking at seeing what the kind of cool kids are doing at the weekend, what they're developing to see where things are, are going. And in, in your case, it's like, you know, what, what are the, what's the music, obviously, the cool kids are making, you know, on their own time, on their own dime, and that'll tell you where, where things are heading, you know, to, with, with no regard for the current, current structures. And also interesting to me is that, and, and this really remarkably, I have found to be the case in the most conservative environments like big enterprise environments when trying to sell software in that actually the technology is only part of the story but but if the technology can galvanize people's you know dreams and ambitions and become like a crowbar for, for change if you will then then that's also important it might actually be 90 percent of what's required to make it make it happen so we we shouldn't pretend that it is the whole solution for sure maybe we'll come back to some of the experiences annabella has had with the the uh, uh lofty ambitions that have, have not been fulfilled of some of the folks that have interacted with so um peter over to you same same yeah. question well so uh at the risk of like turning myself into a meme uh like because I've, I've done this before where <laughs> again yeah, exactly. Uh, I want to talk a little bit of, I want to jump back uh, to the 19th century. Okay, bear with me here. Um, so the very first, essentially commercial music was played at fairgrounds in order to sell a, a tool for listening to music, which was a graphophone, which later turned into the gramophone technology, right? Um, I think it's really funny because you could think of this as the first like music license by none other than the Columbia Phonograph Company, which ended up turning into Columbia Records. Um, fast forward to like the 1970s was when actually music recorded recordings got uh, copyright protection because you had um, basically, you know, consumer of available recording technology in the 70s, which was like cassettes. You had eight tracks as well, but like cassettes le led to like the mixtape. Um, so I think there's a really interesting interplay between copyright and technology that, and, and this is on the production recording, you know, distribution side. And now it's like, we've done this weird leapfrog into this ephemeral abstract distribution called digital. Um, and I think like we have, we are in the wild west and things are landing. And for me, where I, I think we should land, I'm not, I'm not going to weigh in on what the music industry is or should be, cause that's not my area of expertise. It's what people want and who should benefit from it is kind of how I think that's how I, Think about products as well and so for me it's ownership or bust i think it's really like you you really really want to put ownership in the hands of the artists and their fans which is why i'm attracted to blockchain that's kind of the dream for me um and so how that's facilitated i want to be the first to say i'm like the evil technology guy in the room i guess uh but i'm actually on the page of annabella and uh and ed which is that you know technology is a service like it, it is supposed to get bad products don't give people what they want bad products fail good products give people what they want. And sometimes there's like this play between like the product and regulation and the audience that like ends up forming a symphony. Now that doesn't always end up in the best place for people. It ends up in the like most capital efficient place for whoever has the ability to make that happen. Um, so where, where do I want to land? Ownership or bust? That's that's like the, the bottom line for me. That's what I really, really care about. Um, and that, I mean, that's what Ed and I are working on too with, with his project, uh, NFT.hiphop. It's, it's an ownership play. It's not like a, it's not like a, I don't know. I don't think you can, I don't think you can supersede an entire industry with one product. I think that's silly, but you, you can force change. So, may, so maybe can we pick up on that and can work backwards again a little bit, if that's okay, a a Annabella, and pick up on the project you've been engaged in and maybe also for the audience, um, break apart a little bit what a non-fungible token is about in in this context how it's being used um, and what it delivers and I might bring up a, a table that we've used in a, a blog 
post we did are called I Want My NFT. Um, this contrasts the nature of uh, web media with now with open media and might, might be useful. But I'll, I'll leave it to you first, Peter and Ed, to talk a little bit about you know what you've actually been doing. So yeah, I, Ed, I, I, yeah I, I mean, I love the crowbar analogy. I think I, I, I'm going to run with that, if you don't mind, Richard, because sure. I think we are looking, Peter and I working on this NFT.hiphop, it's the first thing is surrounding what are the hip hop heads, first editions. And I, in my magazine years ago, um, there was something called The Last Word and was a column that was a satire that featured um, a significant artist of that month of that moment, whether it was social impact, political impact, lifestyle impact, um, musicological impact or whatever, they were vitally important to the hip hop era at that moment. So the artist is a guy named Andre Leroy Davis and we've been friends for years and he had taken from the pictures heads, the heads of the artist because that's his, you know, that's what he's known for his uh, capturing them. So I, I looked at that and I said, you know, what I want to represent in a piece of NFT art is how these iconic figures, these hip hop heads feature in the 47 years of the hip hop era. So I created um, some code that pulls significant numbers from to power the sine waves and the animation frame rate to create this plasmoidic background that the heads are then placed upon. So that's the art. But then I wanted to apply the crowbar to the industry and the artists themselves, because I think you have to crowbar the artists out of complacency. You have to help them to help themselves, not in a paternalistic way, but in a partnership way. And so NFTs have the capability of having royalties applied to them off of the sales. So what Andre and I did was we donated, we gave a gift to the Universal Hip Hop Museum the number ones of the editions. And this is, it gets complicated. There are 47 of each series. Like, you know, so anyway, the last 10 in the series were gifting to the artists themselves. And numbers two through 37 are going for sale in the, to be auctioned off. But for the whole two through 47, there's a 10% royalty that goes to the artist that's represented in the art. You know, artists, illustrators, they do pictures of public figures all the time. You don't have to give anything to the public figure. But I said, why not have the creatives help the creatives? Why not make it this big thing that ex that exhibits the power of blockchain? So the artist or the artist estate, some of them have passed away. If they create a market around the NFTs that feature them, they get 10 percent of that those proceeds forever yeah i want to go on yeah, I wanna talk, because, i want to comment on this yeah. this is my favorite kind of project to work on because i mean this is entirely ed's idea we're just providing like the technology for it like i said earlier um and it's really really cool because you know this was previously infeasible and because of our new nft standard it made it so that we could offer this concept of perpetual royalties meaning that <clears throat> in order to transfer this you need to send to the actual like the, the app, right? The NFT app needs to know how much it was it was bought for, so to speak, on any marketplace in perpetuity. So like behind the scenes, it's hard coded called perpetual royalties, meaning like, yeah, UHHM uh, will get 1% of every sale of anything that goes through this NFT app in the, f forever in the future. Why is this really interesting to me? A lot of people are very short sighted about NFTs right now. Um, and I think that's okay. It's okay because it's like, yeah, like, you know, People sold something for 69 million. Some guy sold like a crypto punk for 11 million recently. Okay, great. That's fine. If if it gets people in the door because of the big t price tag and they're like eyes are bulging and they're greedy, fine, whatever. What's really, really cool is over delivering to people who haven't necessarily thought through like, what is the 10 year play? Um, and in my mind, that's something really, really cool. You could, you could essentially build residuals into somebody's like artistic career um, that like, you don't need to then go through like a long drawn out legal process for this. Now, of course, the regulation is going to have to catch up to this because we've done something that may be illegal to Annabella's point, according to certain artist contracts, not not the ones we're currently working on, but like that that pattern. 
regulators are going to have to figure that out. But I mean, for now, it's like, well, this is happening and like moving forward, as far as we know, it's legal. And we're, we are actually pushing regulations forward, for example, in Switzerland using this. So like, it's this, once again, this really interesting play between product um, and then the regulation and then right in the middle where it should be are the owners, right? Which is like right now artists, but there's going to be more so, owners. So, so, so my, okay, if I may, um, I think what I'm hearing is a couple of exciting developments. So one is uh, the ability to administer uh, the the rights and the royalties of these artists in a more efficient and effective and, and you know exhaustive way. Um, and I think maybe we should connect that back to, to the uh, discussion that Annabelle Bella was leading off. Um, and I also hear, um, you know, a truly exciting way in which you can create a kind of digital mixed media kind of product that can be auctioned in these open markets um, and, you know, and mixed media and mixed artists and all sorts of exciting concepts. And obviously Blau who didn't you know, join us had did something super exciting with the album um, and was, you know, 11.3 million in a couple of days that he managed to, to pull off through, through that auction, but just a month or two ago. And um, so that's very exciting. Um, so let's, let's go back to the royalty issue and to spark a or to sort of place a thought for, for the next sort of phase of the conversation. What we've seen be tremendously successful in the use of NFTs in other environments, say, for example, in the, in the sports licensing arena, is where you have something that represents the, the relationship between the fan and, say, the, the athlete. And then that is used in some ongoing interactions and dialogue and gameplay and, and so forth. And so what, what I'd like to speculate is that if, if we can re rethink the concept of a fan club, that's exactly yeah. yes. And Richard, let that me that let me would be really in. interesting. There's a, there's a key. I, I, there's a key thing here that is often missed. One of the the reason, I mean, one of the main reasons I chose to go with near, and I get very excited about this. So I made and because it really bothers me. There's a fallacy out there related to NFTs about these royalties and you're going to be able to get your royalties because the nat the decentralized nature of the blockchain but on ethereum and I'm not knocking ethereum but on ethereum generally you have to you've got a decentralized platform but you have to go to a centralized marketplace to realize the royalty returns it's not the royalties are not on the smart contract itself with near the royalties are on contract so you're not going from decentralized to centralized it's decentralized for real and that is a significant fact it changes everything you're not as an artist I, and i i'll back on the plantation like you were because what happens with a lot of these tech plays is the technology companies come out and they say oh we've solved this for you you're going to be you're gonna be free, you're gonna be so long, but you're only free if you stay with us. That's not freedom. That's the same thing. No, no for sure. We definitely, we definitely have, have created some more um, centralization in, in this kind of process of innovation. But but we've now twice um, you know, struck upon this point of kind of royalty collection and so forth. An Annabella, could you try and marry that up to the kind of state of the art right now and the crisis that, that's going on, um, at least here, here in the UK? and um, your experience of, you know, do we have a, you know, cat's chance in hell of, of you know, reimagining the music industry anytime soon? Well, no, I, I think independent artists, um, as was being said, have been doing really exciting things like this for ages. Imogen Heap, who you may know, I think released her song Tiny Human on the blockchain using smart contracts gosh, six, seven years, eight years ago. And I have been speaking continuously to loads of companies who talk to me about blockchain, now NFTs, but before blockchain, smart contracts and this ability to unpick and, and solve all the issues. And I, I'm not a lot, I, as I say, we're hugely in favor of how technology, the MMF has always been a campaigner for technology, always been hugely supportive of digital music and the shift from physical to digital and really spend a lot of time helping artists and managers adjust to uh, new innovations. In fact, we have an entire program we are connect where we connect exciting new companies who've got new ways of 
artists making those revenues and helping them to uh, helping them to generate alternative revenue sources, whether that be all the all the excitement recently around live streaming or whether that be around NFTs or whether that be around Patreons that actually can also bring lots of money into artists. And I, I don't like to be negative, but you do rub against rights issues. And this has happened recently with NFTs. The moment the NFTs contain music, for the vast majority of artists, not and I know independent artists don't, but the vast majority of artists who people are listening to, who have a large fan base, the vast majority of those are working within the, the, the structures of assigning their rights in exchange for investment. And you're right, Ed, you can get amazingly innovative artists who don't need to sell their rights away in exchange for investment. You talk about retaining ownership. Every artist starts out with ownership. The thing is they need to cut through. They need to cut through all the, what is it, 40,000 tracks released a week on Spotify? Right. Well, you right. can own your so rights. How, so, how, so how can we solve that problem? Is there is there a model you can imagine where yeah, I'm there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a grant a grant that helps those artists get off the ground from a from a platform from which you know they ha will they then invest their activity and then ultimately that's recouped is there a there model are loads them? and loads and loads of ideas i know ed's yeah. talking about others there are all kinds of ways that artists can try and generate and grow the fan base they're still in massive competition you say to every single new artist that you can't give every single new artist the the thousands of pounds of investment they need to get to a certain level and in some cases it does does make sense for artists to work with with major labels with indie labels because they need that investment and also the skills and expertise so we are not anti-label what we have been anti is people being tied into very long contracts often in perpetuity at, at rates that were signed during a digital era so this panel was originally framed around which we've not really talked about but a parliamentary inquiry in the uk which was looking at music streaming because many artists have not seen any benefits Many artists have not seen any benefits from the up, uplift and growth in streaming. And as much as I'd love to tell them all that they need to go off and create NFTs and that'll solve the problem, the moment they put any of the music that a lot of them were famous for into those NFTs, they, those, they, that music is owned by their labels. So we have pushed for things very strongly, like writing off recoup balances. We'd love to see reversion rights. In fact, I know in the US, in theory, you have this 35-year right that hardly anyone can can manage to exercise and, and, and a lot of court cases left right and center. Annabella, can you, can you, Annabella, can you expand though on this question of why artists have not benefited from streaming? Because you know, in my intro, you know, I pointed out this had happened and had not benefited the artists, but why is that exactly? And so it, maybe it's not all artists. Is, what's and the I reversion kind of, right? No, fair enough. And I, I'm, try, I'm trying to give both sides here. So actually, there are some artists who are doing incredibly well from streaming. I have members whose artists are not enormous, but they're they've got millions of monthly listeners. And they own their own rights and they built in, in within their genre. Um, and some of them, they own their, their, own, their own labels, are receiving and have been fine through this crisis. In fact, if you talk to the manager of AJ Tracy, he's, you know, they get all their, they get all their royalties from streaming from all the platforms, more or less directly from their distributor. Uh, they, yes, they haven't been able to perform live, which is awful. It's been awful losing the connections to the fans. It's been awful losing the income from that. But they have been able to to um, to survive through it and will be able to continue to invest. However, the artists who certainly certainly the the artists who sign contracts pre digital and in fact many who sign contracts in the early digital era, so the early two thousands, are not on great royalty rates and most of them are unrecouped because the way it works as an artist is you need investment, you need help to find and grow your fan base. You may have built a fan base in your local town, in your local city, you may even have grown that, but you want to go national, you want to go across out of your state in the US, you want to go out of your country in the EU or you want to go international, often you need that big scale and investment. And so in exchange for the investment, you sold away the rights to your music and they've given you an advance and you would then spend the rest of your career in many cases paying off that advance out of your 15 to 20% royalty rate, in some cases much lower than that. And that's the issue. You're still paying off this theoretical debt you own to the label before you earn any more money. So you don't earn anything more from streaming until that backlog is paid off. And that's only been paid out of your percentage share. Um, and as, as I say, in some cases, a very low percentage share because particularly the contracts pre-digital, they'd have all kinds of deductions for packaging Packaging deductions were then applied, certainly by some labels, were then applied at one point to digital revenue because they called it a technology deduction. So you've had issues of artists seeing their music streaming and not earning a penny for it because in theory it's it's drip 
paying back this debt that they owe, which is why Sony Music, sorry to carry on, but Sony Music made a really interesting announcement, which actually followed on from something that Beggars Music had done in the UK, where they said, after a certain amount of time, we're now going to discount the unrecouped balances and we're going to start paying through. And for some of the artists, it won't be huge amounts of money. But if you had a hit in the 90s or the 80s and you've been seeing nothing and suddenly you start getting a check of $1,000, $2,000 a month, maybe $5,000 a month, that can actually change your life. And it can also re-incentivize you to get encouraging building your fan base again. So there are things that can be done. And I, like I said, I'm not anti-NFTs, I'm not anti-blockchain, but I do get a little bit frustrated when people come in and go, oh, all you need to do is we've got a great idea, bring your fan base here and we're going to make you millions. And then the moment they actually start looking at the detail, they can't pay you directly even if they wanted to. So let me, let me say this. It, uh... Yeah, it's. A, I guess we can all agree it's another tool crowbar in the in the you know toolbox that is kind of useful for for kind of catalyzing change here. And change is you know is clearly happening. Sounds like some of the the problems are definitely just down to outdated structures to those contracts. And there's you know some of the the firms the record labels are waking up to that, and that's great. Um, but you know I, I think um, there is a, a kind of a bigger opportunity. Um, to um, you know, take NFTs and recreate, as I think we were starting to talk about, Ed, like the concept of a fan club, right. um, and um, and and so not and so two things at the same time. And I should be careful what I say here. The in the venture capital industry, a lot of firms have started modeling themselves kind of on the music industry or the movie industry. So not just providing capital, but providing connections and marketing and being hands on and so forth. Um, and but I see here in the music industry the potential to allocate capital to great artists through in an automated fashion using you know should we say decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs as they're most often referred to um, and you know capture the royalty relationship and the conversation relationship and maybe even a kind of fan club relationship in 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 a NFTs and a whole series of NFTs and and do without. You know all of the existing contracts and record labels, and I say I should be careful because people talk about doing the same thing to the venture capital industry as as well. Um, so, what do we think about that, Ed? And do, I, can I, we reinvent the fan club? Yeah, that's what I mean. I've been looking at doing that for the past twenty years, actually, and you know the advent of NFTs finally gave the last tool that was needed to make it a reality. The the, the hip hop heads drop, for instance. Many of these artists, some of them are from way back. The artist contracts are ridiculous. As Annabella pointed out, some of the contracts were, they're pulling for packaging. They're pulling for breakage still on some contracts. What breaks in digital? So, you know, it's just absurd why the artists aren't getting paid, but they do tour. They do still have fan bases. And so the reason we're giving the artists the gift of the 10 NFTs is to one of the things with NFTs is provenance. You can see who owned it. You can see whose wallet it was in, all of that. So there's value because the famous person owned it, but also the other, the other NFTs, the artists, when they're touring, they can give backstage access to the NFT owners, people who own their NFTs. They can have a private Zoom with these people. They can go to lunch. They can create a secondary market that's an energized and specialized fan club. They're golden mm -hmm. tickets. And so that's outside of the place where they, they're getting ripped off. There's no other word for it. They're getting ripped off. I, my, my life is full of artists with whom I am friends. So I've been living this for a long time. Some super famous artists and some that have earned basically nothing from their careers. But I wanted to design something that allows all of them to benefit from their creative output. I really believe that. And that's what, you know, we put this package together to enable that because that's the part of the NFT technology that's real. That's the part that they can all execute on. Are they going to have to do a lot work? Yes, but it's not a lot because they can tie it into what they are already doing. Great technology is technology that lets you do what you're already doing easier. Thanks. That's 
That's Annabella, it. can I can I can I ask you to try and resp uh, respond to this? Um, can we break out of the local optimum or where we can, the trap that the industry is currently in using that kind of approach? Can you conceive of that being successful? Well, what you know, what are the obstacles? I think the kind of thing Ed's talking about isn't really breaking apart the industry. It's sort of working around it in in the same way as as you know Patreons have done, and in the same way as as other kind of similar services where artists offer their fans things other than their music essentially because they own the other things i mean right. an awful lot of artists for years have been doing things like making books one of my favorite artists made an app about 10 years ago about his album so the artists have always been really innovative and looking for ways to work around the industry uh, i'm not saying that there aren't technologies that that can help and actually what you're saying about smart contracts is really interesting about how in the long term, that might be able to underpin all those transactions and ensure better and correct accounting. Because the other thing is, of course, part of the issue is some of the contracts are appalling. But the other issue is even if those contracts are appalling, it's very, very hard to actually audit and follow the transactions of money through, through the chain. And big artists can do it and they go in and audit every few years and they find out they've not correctly been paid what they should be. But the music industry is full of black boxes unattributable income, which goes as slush fund. We were talking about dubbing income the other day. You know, they would say, well, we can't attribute it back to the artist, so it goes to the label's bottom line. And I do think things are being done in this space, some amazing use of AI, actually, at the moment, trying to do things like look at uh, all the residuals on TV and film, so all the tiny payments mm -hmm. every time a piece of music is used, and trying to make sure those are correctly attributed back to the artist, because most of the time they're not, because all the data is incorrectly put in. Even set lists, believe it or not, I've been talking to a company that's looking at all the collecting society set lists where someone's filled something in quite badly, or there's a covers ban, so you can't see who wrote, you know, you can't trace necessarily that easily who, what the song was performed and who wrote it. But actually, I think if most of us were to look at it, we'd be like, oh, that's a band that's covering Pink Floyd. We know that song and we know that the, that the band is a play on the name of Pink Floyd. So it's probably that song. But at the moment, the collection society systems just say doesn't compute and it goes yeah. into a black box. You need, so yeah, you there's need exciting some, stuff going on. There's some really exciting some stuff. Some fuzzy algos would probably help there, but p picking are, up on that, and, and they are doing, yeah. And picking up on your and your point about, you know, you you spoke about image and heap, and like you, I, I, it's it's a bit lamentable that that's been the example that's been cited for sort of half a decade, <laughs> um, and I think it was a project called Ujo out of consensus that they sort of did it on. Um, and then I know someone else um, uh, who launched a project in the space called STEM, Alana Rabkin, in, over in LA. I don't know if you came across her, but then soon ditched the blockchain uh, component. Um, apologies to her if I'm not up to date with the late, latest sort of incarnation. But why has that, on, just on the kind of, you know, collection of royalties side on the kind of administration side why has that been so challenging and do you see that this could now change i think possibly because there are vested interests in sorting it out at the moment if you don't fix it the money goes to the big companies um after it sits there for a certain amount of time and it's paid over they would say that's entirely unfair of course they would say they are investing in technology who's, to who's correct who's correct who's correct <laughs> Well, I mean, the moment, every time you look at it, you're saying, why hasn't this been fixed for years and years? Why have we put more complicated systems in? And then you look at all the intermediaries who benefit from those systems. But but there are, there, like I said, I can't, I mean, I would, who knows who's correct? I would say that there are initiatives taking place. There are companies trying to disrupt that space and we are trying to help support them in doing so. I want to interject something really quickly, which is um, something has changed in the universe too, which is this transition from, so you, you guys talked about the production cost of music, right? And it did make a lot of sense. Like, I, I think Annabella, a theme of what you're saying is these things exist because of reasons, right? Like you're, 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 it's not like they just emerged overnight and they're, they're from evil people who want to do evil things. They, they exist for reasons. One thing that hasn't caught up in the music industry is that, you know, software got a leg up on hardware uh, during the like Silicon Valley explosion because it was so much easier to distribute a million units than to have to set up a manufacturing uh, line and have production facility pay for all of that, right? Inclu including, you know, like the, the old term was spoilage, right? I mean, but yeah, broken things um, in the production line, those are not necessary in software. Now they're no longer necessary in music production as it's become completely digital. And so what's weird to me is like going from like how software funding and Richard is like extremely familiar with this for the last, I don't know, 30 or 40 years, it's always like, well, 
a venture capitalist or you know some some angel investor someone with money gives someone like me a bunch of money for a portion of like m my organization the entire value not revenue share not royalties it's ownership equity and it's surprising that hasn't taken off for music yeah I, and i think it's partially because we have these historical contracts and a lot of them are messy and like there, there's going to be this legacy transition but when people figure out some some innovative lawyer is going to come along and going to start like a business for new up-and-coming artists and say like hey actually you know i got my friends who are rich to just give you a big bunch of money and you can do what with whatever you want your music is a product and we'll take equity right so like i actually think that that is a more realistic future well, for, like, well more well more than your music is the product you, you're kind of your creativity your career yeah, is the yeah, product totally. more, you know broader than that Ooh, and, um, and that brings me to my second piece which is on ed's earlier point which is nfts are so much more interesting i think of these and i want to like get this in people's heads as a new channel of engagement, just like Twitter or Instagram, NFTs are a channel of engagement, a decentralized, permissionless, blah, 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 jargon, 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 doesn't matter. They are a channel of engagement between an artist and their fans, and they can be tiered by the artist, controlled by the artist. Rewards can go from the artist to the fans and vice versa. So, so they're not necessarily just an asset or, or, or a contract or you know some legal unit. They're actually a channel, and I think that's much more interesting. And so we, can we press on some of these capabilities a little bit? Some people in the audience may hear the idea that you kind of essentially sell a piece of your career, your creativity of your, your entire life uh, and think that sounds a little bit scary. Um, I mean, there are, and maybe there are other characteristics of this new open media world we can talk about, but one of them should be the fact that it's less scary than the web media because there aren't platforms that ultimately uh, will start acting in their own interest versus acting in the interest of the creators or the users, or that is in, in the intention, at least. They're built so that they cannot be evil, to use your word, uh, Peter, uh, that, that, that the power, the, the market power that they gain will not corrupt them. Um, and this is done through being able to codify the way that they operate in software uh, and not just in kind of murky uh, contracts and, and, uh, and other approaches. But can we build on th that? Um, because I think it's an interesting development yeah. that enables us to think in, in new ways about how um, artists may, you know, look to have a, a life, a fruitful life, you know, doing what they love. Sure. Um, but also other, you know, specific things around, again, to really explain to people what is now possible with the way royalties work, what isn't now possible with, you know, the mixing different, you know, creative uh, media together and so forth that, Ed, you might have done. So Either, anybody. So listen, I, I, one of the things that got me so excited about blockchain, I can't emphasize it enough, is the fact that it enables trustless economic interaction. Okay, so all of the garbage that I saw over my years in the music industry and everything where the contracts are murky and you don't know who should get what and they can't find it, all of that's gone. And so what I realized is that that local artist who plays gigs in their town and the surrounding towns, but who also has to have a fast food job or whatever it is to support their, their love, their creative output, all of a sudden has the ability to leverage the blockchain, right? To pay for their life. That's real. It, because it's just a math problem. It's just math. If you take out all of the costs of distribution, you take out the costs of all of these other things that go into managing the trust relationship, the distribution, the creative, product, all of this stuff, and you leverage the blockchain for that, that money becomes yours because it's you, the, the creative, interacting with your fans. And on top of it, because you have the nature of digital, the the way that one of the things we leveraged when I mentioned the $250, but you need millions to start an international magazine, we leveraged the fans. They were our force for propagating what we had. And the artists, we, they do this all the time. But all of a sudden, what blockchain makes possible and makes real is the ability for those local people, it's not the huge stars, but the local ones to get a good living from their creative output. It's just math. 
Ed, a, br a brilliant point, and, and uh, I haven't seen a super comprehensive analysis uh, of this, but I think it's important also to break it into halves. And, and Chris Dixon over at A16Z wrote an interesting blog post about it. Um, I think it was called A Thousand Fans or whatever, which drew that's uh, exactly referring, yeah. referring, referring to another essay. And but I mean, roughly speaking, I think the maths were like if if you uh, you know increase the margin by fifty percent, um, the amount that going going to the creator might be increased by 6x or something of that nature. Um, the, the, totally transformative to the economics of an individual in that whole, whole equation. Um, but, and I think that's, that's clearly critical. I, I, I do think, though, that it's quite possible, and I don't know who, who has done the math on this, that, that that's even just a small part of the story, that actually that once you unlock the potential for people to find careers and find different fans and find your tribe and all, the, all these good things, yeah, exactly. the, 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 the pie itself, to use the uh, you know, it's use metaphor, you, is, much, is much bigger. And, the and you have to separate out. Opportunities it's not it. about becoming the global superstar. There are people who just love making music, who love creating things, and if they could make the same living that they would make with a regular, what we would call a regular job, they've reached their heart's desire. That's what they've satisfied that. And too often the people in the industry are thinking about become everybody becoming a big star. Well, first of all, that's not possible. And secondly, that's not necessarily what's driving so many of these people who have amazing things in them that the world is gonna benefit from hearing. And the audience doesn't have to be huge. The no, that's, most that's of true. them have the ability to have a local fan base because they're already playing clubs. They're already yeah. getting reaching out and getting 5,000, 10,000 people who every time they do a show, they're going to show up, do the math, and you realize, wow, that's a living. The problem is that they have to have all of these other things in the old model that took the money away from them. That's there there the are a lot of middle class artists who do that often after they've got out of their label deals and after they found their first a thousand right, true fans. Exactly. So they've got the first 30, 40,000 fans, but a lot of them, and this is where I'm sort of playing devil's advocate for the labels who we often spend most of our time fighting for. But when artists themselves, the reason artists want managers and the reason artists want labels is that artists tend to be great at making and performing music, or the good ones are. Mm -hmm. What they're not necessarily great at is all the administration that goes with that. And also knowing how to market their so music, I'm knowing how with, to promote I'm, I'm, their music. I'm working with we, some managers who are doing exactly that now because they're, they're exactly. doing what they do. They're doing what the managers do. And it took a little while to get them to realize, but they're like, wait a minute, this is what I do. And if it's just me and my client making the money, wow, this is a better world. So we have a lot um, of amazing guess, managers been... and artists doing that. We also have other ones who then find they get to a ceiling and it depends on the artist's ambition where they need to widen the team. And it's That's also pretty tough for managers on their commission basis, I'll tell you, to effectively run a label yeah, for right. their... And you do find, so whenever we talk to those managers, they're often very frustrated as well when we have conversations with Spotify or Apple or Amazon or any of the other players, because they still feel that, and we know it's true, that if you want those brilliant playlists, you have to get the playlist pitched to by the label or the distributor. And if you're going through a distributor where you own all your own music, it's brilliant, you hardly pay anything, whether it's a tune core or a CD baby or a Muse, fantastic but you're one of thousands and thousands possibly 10,000 who are releasing you know that month and therefore you're no longer a priority so you don't get the playlist so there's some brilliant music that never gets heard because it's not got the strategic connections and marketing background that often people need to break out which is why a lot of the kind of middle class artists ed talks about have initially had that team who worked with them and built it and who then get their music back after a certain amount of time. And they can then work in more innovative ways where they're connecting directly to that fan base. I want to add to that. Can I, can I, before we come to the question of like, who's building the tools to make uh, it possible for these smaller artist centric teams to be successful. Can I ask you, Annabella, are they kind of intermediary platforms that are being successful at all? I, I'm hearing names like Platoon and AWOL and Muse. Do, do you know these platforms? Are they effective? I do, yes, I do. And what's interesting about them is that obviously they're effective for some artists who become their priorities. 
Um, and they, yet yeah, you retain your rights or you're, you're on a kind of time limited um, assi uh, licensing of your rights rather than assignment of your rights. When you work with those platforms, you're on label services deals. But <laughs> they inevitably sign loads more people to those deals, which are much better deals than they can make ultimately successful and that they can prioritize. So I've got some members who absolutely bloody love them and they say they've been amazing, transformational. They also say all the workers come back to the manager and artist most of the time. They then end up having to manage their own teams or bring in their own um, connections, PR, you know, all the kind of stuff that might have been done for by a label. But if you're not a priority on those, <laughs> as with everything you're struggling and you're still outside of the network and you've not necessarily got the investment so there, there are brilliant things happening and again some of it depends are you are you good you have to be good but there's a lot more good artists out there than there are um the ability i would say to be prioritized to get on things like the playlist so they inevitably radio playlists inevitably end up narrowing down the opportunities for artists to get heard so, so how big is that gap? You say there are many more artists out there than the ability to get on the playlist. Ten times as many. It's enormous. I haven't. I should. I should have had the. Have you guys been reading Will Page's book, Tars and Economics? It's fascinating. The size of that long tail is growing and growing and growing, and the number of tracks released every month, the number of bedroom artists. As I think Peter was saying, it costs much, much less to make music now than it did. There are lots of people making really good music in their bedrooms. They're all competing with each other. If you're all coming out that week. You know with the best will in the world and the people at spotify we know them well they're great they still have to select some and not select others so inevitably it's still going to be really hard to cut through which is why an awful lot as i say will work with those established trusted partners to get their voices heard and amplify them certainly in the short term the hope is that they can do it through through better deals just one final thing talking about artists going around the side and then blowing up tiktok's been really interesting particularly for a uh, a lot of music that may be outside the kind of mainstream genres because you've seen artists blowing up on TikTok and then you've seen the labels, major and indie, chasing around them, offering them incredible deals. So licensing deals, enormous amounts of money up front, really short terms, so maybe for only two or three singles, which effectively then means the artists will have the investment and the money, hopefully the fan base to then go on and work with who they want to, to grow their fan bases longer term and to have those sustainable careers that talks about or at least we hope so so I, I don't want to think this is doom and gloom you speak to some people particularly in the us about the crazy nature of some of the deals being done some of them are incredibly progressive <laughs> what they don't help is the artists who signed 10 15 right. 20 30 years ago who are still stuck in the contracts they signed at that point so um there was another chap who was a uh, guy who was going to be on the uh, on the panel at one point at least, uh, maybe moderating. Uh, Ron, the CEO and founder of uh, Audius, and uh, one incredible stat he gave me. Well, when I first met him 18 months ago, there was like 5,000 people on his platform, and then uh, just over the last couple of months, probably in the the, the recent frenzy of NFTs and and uh, open media, there were like 500,000 people a week joining um, his platform, and the incredible growth numbers. He was focusing very hard on how to build these, you know, tools to for these artist-centric teams or for the artists themselves. To, um, I just want to kind of maybe dive into a little bit in the last, you know, three, four, five minutes here on, you know, who are building those tools, what tools are ne needed for this kind of this, you know, bleeding edge sort of frontier. Peter, Ed, Annabella, any of you? Sure. I mean, you know, one of the things we're doing at Near Protocol is uh, this new initiative I'm starting, uh, which we call Satori, but you can think of it as like Near Product Labs. And the main thrust of what we're pushing forward is creators and communities. So, I mean, we're really, really focused. I mean, this goes back to my very first comment, which is like, it's ownership or bust. Um, we, you know, th th this is really close to my heart because I have friends who are artists who have been screwed. I mean, just like Ed, I'm sure, but you know, younger people who I, I've, I've watched them, some, some of their careers take off and then others, they're like just stuck in this really dark place where they're amazing artists, but they can't figure out the distribution because they're just really bad at the, at the like marketing side and they don't get signed or whatever it is. Right. That's really painful to watch your friend go through, especially when, you know, like if you, if, if you are a fan of their music, um, you know, so, so seeing that as it goes forward, I think is really exciting. It's just like being able to spend more time and money on creators and communities and figure this out the right way, which is what I'm about. Yeah. And Annabella makes a great point that one of you know, many artists are not skilled at the marketing, the promotion and that other stuff. 
they're artists and that's what they do. And so the management, that's why I've been working with some managers to get them the tools to be able to help their clients effectively take hold of this new opportunity. But it becomes a very interesting team. And as you know, Chris Dixon was spot on talking about thousand true fans. And when he's talking about that, the word of mouth, my, my, my partners and I started street teams. Like that's a, that's a real thing. And you know, those thousand true fans are your street teams and street teams in this digital space are actually global now. You know, I was talking to an artist yesterday who was very famous 10 years, no, that's, oh my goodness, I'm so old now, but I, I feel young, um, 30 years ago. And I was pointing out to him, I said, you know, there are probably some gen, he's in the US, he's up in, you know, in the New York area, but there are some Gen X women in, let's say, you know, Japan, who would lose their minds to be able to have a conversation with him. And that is now monetizable. And so his fan base is not huge, but it's still there. And that's what this stuff makes possible and real. And that's where, I, if we get really creative, even those artists who have been, there's no other term for it, screwed over in the past, they can now take the, what they built in the past and monetize it. But I, I, you know, I emphasize again, it's, you need a platform like, and I, I don't want to sound, I, I am a near booster. I can't lie. I'm a near <laughs> booster because it has to be on contract. If you go back and you centralize, and Annabelle, I think even before the conversation we had earlier, it's there's too many people who are trying to be the new overlord. You know, oh, we're going to do it nicely this time. Never believe them. Get it in something that is open, that's trustless. That's how you win. And that's what Nier has built. And that's why I'm all in on Nier. I, I, I'm a believer. <laughs> it's a strong pitch, Ed. And the good thing is that because Vitalik is only coming to give his pitch tomorrow at the event, you can. And I love Vitalik. Here. He's near. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just, it's one of those things. The technology is strong, right? It's just that when you have technologists produce something for an industry or something that they don't deeply understand, like the fact that the royalties aren't baked in, the fact that that's not a capability, there's literally no song that I can think of that's not owned by at least three people. <laughs> like that's a, let's, like, let's 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 see if we can try and feed that into the far side to, tomorrow with uh, with Richard Waters. Um, so let's try this. Uh, we're right at the um, uh, the top of the hour. Um, just a, a minute each. Uh, just wrapping up on um, you know what we've been discussing. Um, who wants to go? For? Annabella, do you want to go first? You know, kind of, what do you think of the conversation? What, where you think we should be discussed? What do you think we should be discussing no, next? I, I think it's fascinating, and I am optimistic. I think the challenges are for artists and managers and the teams to figure out who to work with and understand more about all these exciting tools, where they can work with them, where they can't, uh, because of contracts. But um, really, to, to understand the breadth of opportunities that there are there to connect and build fan bases and also seek funding. And, and this was a fascinating discussion about how, how we can leverage those opportunities to yeah, give more independence to artists. Thank you. Peter? Sure. Uh, well, I mean, thanks, Ed, for the huge near plug. We're not paying him, I swear. <laughs> no, you're not. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I, I just want to say this was really fun, and thanks, uh, the co-panelists and, and Richard, for moderating. Um, if you are an artist and you want to figure this out, um, I'm open to talking. Um, I have regretted this some days, but my emails are open. It's peter at near.org if you want to learn about NFTs. Um, I talk to anyone who's interested in this in any form. You don't have to build on Near uh, just to talk about it with me. Um, if you don't know what Near is, Near is a layer one, meaning it's a blockchain. We have a bridge. That's what oh, this icon represents. It's two Ethereum, so you can get the benefit of Ethereum on Near. Um, and then we're also carbon neutral, which is huge for every single artist that I've spoken with uh, so far. Certified carbon neutral. So yeah, that's that's my plug. But this was awesome. Ownership or bust. That's the last thing I want you to take from me. Great, Ed. I don't. I, I thought I had my mic drop, but I, I, you know, I just have to say, um, thank you for this panel. This was great. I, I have. I'm very optimistic about the future for artists and management and the labels. I don't know. 
I, I think that they're, they need to reinvent themselves. And I, I have friends who run some of the majors and they know they have to reinvent themselves. Uh, I ask everybody show up Saturday. Um, we're doing the Hip Hop Heads first edition drop uh, noon Eastern time. Come and show up, support these hip hop artists because I think this, I'm calling it artist emancipation uh, days, the beginning of that. Uh, I really think that we've put something together that's going to help the entire music industry. And you know, I'm passionate Brilliant. about it, if you can't tell. Thank you. No, yeah, well, I think we, we definitely got that. So look, in, in closing then, um, first of all, you know, thank you to, to all of you. You know, Annabella, I thank you. Um, you helped educate us a little bit on the, the crisis over here on the, on the streaming rights. Um, I think, you know, clearly they're just old elements of the way it's done today that are constraining things. But I, I don't think any of us would put you into the Luddite uh, category at all, let alone your, your organization. I think, Ed, um, you know, your insight into the innovation taking place of the kind of rebellious, you know, fringes and, you know, crowbarring the uh, artists out of their complacency was was uh, super exciting. Um, can I say ownership or, or bust again for you, uh, Peter? Um, I think that's great. And I think we're all united in wanting to make sure that, um, you know, these platforms don't devolve into doing evil things and, and get corrupted and so forth. Um, I want to uh, thank James Fabricant, who reminded me of the quote I used at the beginning, and after whom we, of course, named our venture firm. Um, and um, actually, um, my brother Will pr prompted me to, to, to think about a, a quote that I think is attributed to David Bowie about, um, you know, the kind of innovation takes place, you know, often where uh, things are subversive and rebellious and cha chaotic and nihilistic. Um, and I think we see some elements of that with this new technology. I think we need to embrace them. Um, but, you know, despite that disruption, uh, I think what we've heard is an incredible level of optimism about how we can actually not just include more artists, but make a much bigger creative and, you know, pie and a set of careers for people. Uh, that growing long tail that, that Annabella, you, you said, Will Page is documenting so well. And hopefully with that, we'll get uh, Nile Rogers and Blau and a whole bunch of other people into another conversation next time we get a chance to to talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cheers, Richard. A poignant wrap up. And thank you to the panelists as well. This has been one of those productive, but more importantly, realistic discussions that I've heard on the topic rather than just positing the blockchain will magically fix all artist problems and then we'll bypass the old world rather than actually work with it. I feel like I quickly have to shout out Annabella's fantastic style, Ed's really lovely interior design and Peter's green screen, but not to mention existence as a meme. Unfortunately, that marks the end of day two and also the end of my stint as MC. But fortunately, tomorrow you'll have my extremely capable colleague, Lata, to guide you through the final day, which kicks off with a presentation from Fabric French's very own venture partner and ORCID CEO, Dr. Stephen Waterhouse, on how we can encode values into a new generation of technology. This has been day two of the Open Web Forum at COGX, curated by Fabric Ventures, and we'll see you tomorrow.